Okay, now I'm not really a betting man like that, but I'd probably be willing to bet that maybe not many of you have heard a sermon on this verse. I've certainly never preached on this verse, but probably never heard it. So a little bit obscure here. Okay, so we're going to take our time and develop it, and hopefully we will see some glorious truths about our amazing God, even in this strange verse in this odd corner of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. There's some, definitely some good stuff here. So I've titled the sermon. You know, that's what takes most in the prep is the title. You get the sermon together. Uh, it's Briars and Friars, so <laughs> it should be a pretty good one. So uh, that's just going to be the two parts of the sermon. We'll talk about the Briars first, and then secondly, we'll talk about the Friars. So let's just get right to it, huh? The Briars. Okay. In our verse, verse 24 here, the Lord speaking through Ezekiel is prophesying about his people Israel. Now, the people of God here are in big trouble with God. Ezekiel is prophesying his judgment. We've seen that a few weeks ago in chapters 8 and 9. So God is really pouring forth his justice upon his people. But in the midst of that, when he did that to them and destroyed Jerusalem and ransacked the cities and scattered his people, what happened is all the nations around Israel, they all started cheering mocking against God's people. They gloated over the destruction of God's people and took out their vengeance on them and cheered in their destruction. So in the last few chapters leading up to this, chapter 25, and it goes all the way through like 29 or 30, God's going one by one to the nations all around Israel and he's pronouncing his judgments upon them because they mocked his people at their destruction. So one by one by one. We read Sidon, that's just one of them here, just to give some context. Uh, but he talks about the Ammonites. He talks about Tyre, that's a little bit across the sea, but still. And then he talks about Egypt and some other nations in there. So that's the context. So in verse 24 here, when he says, The house of Israel, there shall be no more a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them amongst all their neighbors. He's talking about the neighboring nations and those people that dwelled around them. And so what happened is, as God's people were facing the punishments for their sins, and these people were cheering, that was like thorns and thistles and briars to God's people, and it was hurting. Spikes and thorns and pricks and the drawing of blood. Uh, we know what thorns are. Every rose has its thorns. That was another contender for the sermon, every rose. But, you know, we did the 80s pop thing a couple weeks ago, so... We'll just chill on that for now. Um, briar here is not like a, you know like a briar, like the the spiky ball that sticks to your uh, sticks to your shoes when you walk through the forest. But briar here is like just a thorn bush. So thorns and briars is basically all the plants that have things that can hurt you, that can prick you, that can spike you, that can pierce you. Okay. And what he's doing here is he's comparing the nations around Israel to these. So, let's just consider the image first. Where does this imagery come from? The imagery of thorns and briars and thistles. This comes to us, of course, way back at the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. You may remember God's curse upon Adam after he sinned. This is verse 17 of Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. So, before Adam and Eve sinned, the garden was the paradise of God. And that means that all the plant life there was luxurious. We've never seen plants of splendor and beauty and fruits of glory like we're in that place. We've never seen that. Our very best offerings today are shadows and whispers and tastes of a taste and scents of a scent. But in that place, all things were perfect and all things were safe. There was nothing in that garden physically that could hurt them. But when they sinned, it plunged not just Adam and Eve and all their children into ruin and misery, but it plunged 
the whole physical creation into ruin and misery, and they were cast forth out of God's paradise, out of the garden, and they were to work. Now, you know, Adam had to work the garden. That was like the best job ever because he was basically just keeks in it, watching over it, you know, enjoying its fruits and, and luxuries. And food in the garden was just given to Adam. It was everywhere. It was abundant. The garden provided for him richly in every way. But now, because of sin, his food wasn't going to come so easy. He was cast forth to the fields, out of the garden, a luxuriousness, out into the field, and he was going to work to eat the plants of the field by the sweat of his brow until he returned to that very own ground. And not only that, but the ground was now going to fight back against Adam, and it was going to produce things like thorns and thistles. So this imagery in Ezekiel, it's drawing from the garden. And so it makes sense, right? Israel is in the land here. God has called them to their own special place, which is like a new garden of Eden. And they were there, but even in that place, it was not perfect. There was thorns, there was thistles. The curse still reached them there and certainly reached them in their hearts. It was their own sin that caused them to be cast out. But the garden is the image here. And God is promising to His people once again that the time is coming when I will restore, when I will redeem, I will make all things new, He says. And in that place, and at that time, there will be no more thorns, there will be no more thistles, there will be no more curse, praise God. So that's the imagery that He's using here. Um, okay, so that makes sense. But now let's ask the question, why does the, why, what does this imagery refer to here and why? What is he, what's he really getting at here? Well, we've kind of said it already. It's the neighbors. It says in the Bible, you shall not be a thorn and thistle to your neighbor. Wow, I didn't get anything on that one. We don't even know. That's, that's terrible. It's from Nacho Libre, sorry. The neighbors are the thorns and thistles, okay? So in this situation, it's even worse than the garden because it's not like there's just plants that are fighting back. Now it's actually people. Now it's intelligent, strong, powerful, capable beings that have become unto them the thorns and thistles and spikes of the curse. So it's, there's, there's this language here that's talking about something greater. It's much easier, I dare say, to deal with actual literal thorns and thistles than it is to deal with people that are like that. And that was the, the grief that God's people were experiencing here was in how everyone was lashing out against them. It's their neighbors. So that tells us that this imagery from Genesis 3 about thorns and thistles, it, it means more than just thorns and thistles. It means that literally. Those things didn't exist before that time. Moths are definitely in that category. Because Jesus said that moths don't, they're not in heaven. Where moth does not destroy, he said. So there's other things in this category with thorns and thistles, but that's one of them. Um, but it represents so much more. Thorns and thistles are a picture of the curse. They're a picture of what has happened in God's creation. Everything has become twisted. Things have become lethal where we expected safety. And everything's been... So it applies to more than just these things, as I hope we'll see in the sermon. Okay, but in Ezekiel chapter 28, it's really not surprising that he would use uh, language from the garden because he's already been doing this in chapter 28. So Ezekiel 28 is, uh, is, is well known for a few reasons, mainly though because there's this interesting passage that starts in verse 12, about the king of Tyre that a lot of Christians have historically believed is actually a description of Satan in the Garden of Eden and talking about his fall. This is Ezekiel 28. Others, you know, of course, scholars are divided, so careers must be made. There's some who think that this is talking about Adam in the garden. Let's just read a little bit of it. So Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 12. This is, you know, this is the same chapter we're in, so... Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Now, Tyre was like the, the, the spot. It was the joint. Tyre was the economic center of the world then. 
So all the wonderful things the world can produce and create was tired. That's what it was. So this was uh, the uh, economic capital of the world. So the king of tires said nicely. What's up, y'all? Okay, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. And then verse 14, you were an anointed guardian cherub, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. All right, this is a pretty amazing passage. Let's think through it just real quick. Ezekiel's talking literally about a literal nation, Tyre. And apparently it had a prince and a king, because right before this he talks about the prince of Tyre, now he's talking about the king of Tyre. So, the king of Tyre must have been a pretty proud dude, pretty glorious chap, beautiful, wise, and he's able to increase his riches through his wisdom, talks about that. Okay. Um, but but the, the king of Tyre was not in the Garden of Eden. Come on now, it's crazy, right? He was not there. This is much later. This guy was just a normal dude, you know? So when it uses this language to talk about the king of Tyre as being in the Garden of Eden, as being the very signet, you know, like a signet ring that puts the imprint of the image into the wax, he's the imprint of perfection itself, a glorious being of splendor, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's a combination right there. Usually you get one or the other if you're lucky. You know, he's got the whole package. Beauty and wisdom. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So you can see why. Now, I tend, to, I'm, I tend to believe this also, that this ultimately is talking about Satan here as the one who fell in the garden. But then there's a lot of people who think that this talks about Adam. Think about Adam in the garden. This is what Adam was too. Adam was the signet of perfection. He was the image bearer of God. And Adam, beloved, was full of, of wisdom, and he was perfect in beauty. Adam was that dude. You know what I'm saying? He was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was his covering. What does that mean? Well, yeah. In the garden was all the beauty of all the, of all the emeralds and diamonds. He lists all of them. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, so on. All the beautiful gemstones that existed in the garden were there to beautify Adam. The priest of Israel reflects this too on his breastplate. He had one precious gemstone for each tribe of Israel. So he had all the array of these different things. In the book of Revelation, the city has these foundations of the different gemstones and emeralds. So this is another theme that goes straight, straight through the Bible. But again, it comes from the garden. That's where all that comes from. Then verse 14, you were an anointed guardian cherub. And that's like, okay, so how many layers of imagery do we have here? It's like metaphors of metaphors of metaphors. So um, Adam was not a cherub, but he was like that. That was his job. A guardian cherub, that's some sort of angelic creature that guards and protects. Um, you remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they were driven out of the garden, God placed a cherub with a flaming sword at the gate and they drove them east out of Eden. So, cherub. So, Adam was like that. He was supposed to be like that. That's what we're supposed to be like. Guardians. Especially those gentlemen over households. We are God's guardians over our households, you know? We are to protect. We are the spiritual watchmen. We must pray. We must seek. We must lead. We must always be on the lookout for evil creeping in. That was Adam's job in the garden. So when that serpent came, Adam should have been ready because he was, he was the guardian there. He failed. So possibly could relate to him. Possibly could relate to Satan. Possibly could relate to all of it. It applies to the king of Tyre. It applies to Adam. It applies to Satan. Why? What's the common thread? Sin. It's what sin does to you. That's the real point here. Sin corrupts God's beautiful creation. This wisdom came from God that Adam had and that Satan had. This beauty came from God that humanity was clothed with and angelic majesties have. It came from God. And yet it was corrupted and focused inward on self. 
rather than outward on God and to bless others, it, it twists within, kind of like thorns and thistles. That's what sin does, beloved. It takes good things and twists them, and they become idols, and they become focused on ourselves rather than God and rather than others. The things themselves can be good, but when they become that, it corrupts us and undoes all our wisdom and beauty before God. Sin fouls us, and it makes us grotesque, and it makes us foolish. So when God turns to Israel finally later in the chapter and says, there will no more be thorns and thistles for you, he's definitely got the Garden of Eden in mind. This means that God's promises here are reaching back all the way to the very beginning, all the way to the root of the problem, which is sin, all the way back to the garden where everything went wrong. God's promise here is sweeping and universal. He's saying that what he's going to do is not just going to patch up some of the problems you're having in this life or even the nation of Israel. It's way bigger than that. It's universal. It's cosmic, he says. I'm going to undo all of it down to the very bottom and renew from within. So it's a mighty promise here in verse 24 when he says this. Okay, let's look at our verse again then. And for the house of Israel, there shall no more be a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is a phrase that appears in Ezekiel over and over and over and over. I don't know, maybe 20 times, something like that. Again and again and again, God's point in Ezekiel is when this happens, when I do this thing, then they will know that I am the Lord. They'll know I'm real when I do this thing. And he uses it of all kinds of different people. He uses it of the nations around, that they will know he is the Lord when he judges them. And he uses it of his sinful people when he redeems them. He says, then they will know that I am the Lord. So the whole point here is that God is making himself known through the work. That's what all God's works do, is they reveal him to us. That's the whole point. Scripture is full of the accounts of all the things God has done in history. And those things, each one of them, teaches us about him. That's, that's why they exist. They don't exist just for themselves as some cool thing to remember. They exist as things God has done, and they show us what God is like. Same thing with the physical creation. It's quite amazing, actually. What God has done in the physical world reveals God to us. And even our own selves do that. So that's why God does what He does. So in this case, it's true. When He removes the thorns and the briars, that it will reveal and show Him who He is. So it's kind of like this, I think. This is a prophet, Ezekiel. He's pretty raw. He's pretty obscure. You know, he's more like, if the prophets were like, you know, hip-hop artists, Isaiah would be like, you know, pop level, mainstream. But Ezekiel is more like underground, pretty raw. You might not always have the taste for him. He's pretty ill, got to say. But God is saying here, I've been saying all this stuff. I'm, I'm saying all this stuff through the prophets. It's me. I'm saying it. But then the word just hangs there and nobody believes it. The children of Israel don't believe it. He's been telling them for a long time. If you don't return to me, you keep worshiping these idols, you keep forsaking me, the fountain of living water, okay, I'm going to cast you out. They didn't believe. It was just this word hanging in the air. But when it's fulfilled, then that's when you know what time it is. When God's word awakens and comes alive, then we know that it's him. So that's the connection there. Here, he's going to do it by destroying the briars and the thorns. Who's that? That's the nations. So, that, look just a couple of verses earlier. That's why I wanted to read this Sidon passage, because this is a perfect example. If we look at verse 22, this is what he's saying to Sidon. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon, and I will manifest my glory in your midst. That reminds me... Uh, <laughs> friend of mine, his, uh, his grandma would always rebuke the devil, but she would call him Satan. Satan? If everything happens, she'd say Satan. That's what Sidon is reminding me of. So there's maybe perhaps a kernel in connection there. 
Anyway, I'll try to tie that together before we're done. All right. Behold, I am against you, O Sidon, and I will manifest my glory in your midst. Okay? Boom. That's the revealing. Manifest my glory. And they shall know that I am the Lord. There it is. When I execute judgments in her and manifest my holiness in her. Okay. So that's pretty serious there. God is connecting the revelation of who He is with the judgment that He's going to bring on these people. Now again, who were these people? They were the mockers of God's people. They rejoiced over the destruction that was happening. And the destruction was pretty nasty, y'all. The people got trapped in the city of Jerusalem and they ran out of food and bad stuff happened. And God told them that. In, in Deuteronomy, He told them the bad stuff that would happen and it did happen. But when these horrible things happened, and this destruction came upon them. The neighbors, they weren't touched with pity and mercy, but rather they were filled with vengeance. And God says, I will destroy them. The people began to say things not just about Israel, but about Israel's God, and that's where you cross the line, man. Can't do that. They start saying, these are not really God's people. God is not able to really save them. God, God must not. The Lord must not be the true and living God. And that's when you've got to watch out. So God's taking this pretty personally also. So he's going to judge Sidon. So he makes himself known to his enemies by destroying them. They will know, it says, that he's the Lord. Not Israel. They will know. Those who are destroyed. Does not the scripture say that every, every tongue will confess? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It says that. It says that all of us will come face to face with God and everyone will acknowledge that He is the Lord. Which is exactly what He's saying here. It will happen. And all of us, that's for us to prepare ourselves and ready ourselves for that day. Ready thyself to meet thy God because we will all stand before Him and we will all know then this judgment on Israel's enemies, it's ultimately, all of this is fulfilled in the doom of Satan. That's my connection with Sidon and Satan. It's all fulfilled in the doom of Satan. That's the whole theme here. This is the satanic offspring. So what God said would happen in the garden. There would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that there would be war now between them. So this is the work of Satan. It's the devil's work the things that these nations were doing. And that's true in our lives too, y'all. When things happen, when people are enraged against us or whatever, I mean, it may be because we've done messed up. <laughs> maybe we sinned, so let's just own that. But maybe sometimes we've taken a stand on righteousness and it's tripped some cats out. Okay, you know what time it is then. That's persecution time. Maybe little, maybe lot, maybe small, but it's real. But in those times, you have to remember that it's not really them. They're being animated. It is, but they're being animated and driven by the devil himself, ultimately. It's satanic force at work. So that allows you to love the person who's enraged against you or resisting you for unjust reasons, if it really is that. It allows you to love them and have compassion and mercy on them because you realize they've been taken captive by Satan to do his will. And that's why... Well, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. This is all in Timothy there. We must be gentle and kind and understanding, like last week's sermon. So that's what we got to be. But ultimately, this will be done when Satan is destroyed. So, okay. God will bring to an end the curse and the one who brought about the curse originally, Satan. Satan, sin, and death. They're all going down. That's what the, that's what the promise is here. So obviously, we're talking about the cross, man. This is where Jesus did this. But let's just keep moving, okay. So that's briars. I think we understand that. Just a brief view. And God's promise to His people is, yo, the time is coming when all those things will be gone. But right now, expect them. But He will bring it about. Okay, secondly, let's talk about friars. Uh, the, not, like, not like air fryers. I know you guys who are super cool, you got the air fryers. I'm about five years behind on that, but... That's not what I mean. I mean more like, well, again, reference our friend Nacho Libre. Earth to Stephen, I am a friar. Okay, a friar is, well, we think of a friar as like a monk. 
a gentleman who gives his life to God and lives at the monastery with the brothers. That's a friar. All right. And you could be of the different Catholic orders. But I looked up this word on a great secret tool I have called Google. And uh, it comes from, it derived, friar derives from this French word frere. Frere, as in au contraire, mon frere. And, 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 and frere derives from this old Latin word that I'm sure Adam knows how to pronounce, and I can't even remember what it is. So. But the word just means actually, ready? Brother. That's what it means. Friar. Frere. It means brother. You know, the brethren. That's what it symbolizes. And that's exactly what their neighbors were not being. You know what I'm saying? That's what God wanted to happen is for there to be friars and brethren, but then instead there was briars and thorns. The brethren here are God's people, the brothers and the sisters, the community of faith. And that's who his promise is to in this verse. As for the house of Israel, that's, it's a house, so it's a family, so it's brothers and sisters, house of Israel. There shall be no more briar or thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. So, then they, that's the house of Israel, will know that I am the Lord. So this is God's promise to them. God's promise to us is that he will make himself known to us in saving us. That's the basic truth here. God revealed to you when he saves you. Now that's true when God saves us of our sins. Yes, that's when God ultimately ultimately comes barreling into our lives and says, here I am, I am, I am the Lord, and we know what time it is. We're like Paul, we see him. But that's true of your entire Christian life. As you go, God is always saving you, beloved. He's always delivering you. He's always keeping you. He's always watching over you. Because when God saves us, it's not like all our problems go away. Usually, that's when the real problems begin. That's when all the unfair stuff seems to happen. Is when now it's like, yo, I thought it would be red carpet in tune with the universe now, but it's like totally different. Now the thorns and thistles seem more prevalent. I know it's the way it goes. But the Lord makes himself known to us in saving us from these things. The Lord will save us from our enemies. That's the promise here from our enemies, from our human enemies, from our enemies, spiritual enemies, and from our enemies of all sorts. That's what we're going to apply this as. Mankind was supposed to be brothers, brethren, one human family. But what happened when sin came into the world is that people started to turn against each other. Think of the classic case, Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain asked. Of course, he's his brother's keeper. But Cain turned against his brother. He was supposed to be a friar, but he was a briar. All right? That's what it was, and that's what sin does. It introduces beef between human beings, between image bearers, fellow image bearers of the same make. It creates stupid things like people trying to Say that there's different races based on what your skin tone is. And our country did a really good job of that one. That was an important part of our country for a very long time. And may the Lord heal it. But stupid things. Finding reasons to look at each other not as the same, but as different. And that's what sin does to us. It turns us away from our brother's keeper into those who persecute each other, hurt each other. That's the point here. There'll be no more thorn or briar to hurt them. It hurts. And that's what sin does to us, and that's what sin does through us, beloved. And so we must be so very aware of it, because that, that propensity, that's still within us, even as Christians. If we're not careful and we're not intentional, we will find ourselves being thorns and thistles to one another rather than keepers and brethren. But God's promise here is he will save us from all this in the end. He will save us from the pain inflicted by false neighbors. That's what this is. We're supposed to be neighbors. It says in the Bible, not to wrestle your neighbor. We're supposed to be neighbors. That's what that means. Who's my neighbor? Everyone's my neighbor. 
fellow human beings are my neighbor. And unfortunately, because of sin, the neighbors tear each other apart. But God's promise is that one day he will save us from that. One day there will be no more enemies. One day there will be no more false neighbors. But we will dwell in peace without any fear of evil ever entering again. He will save us from that. That means that all those times you've been hurt for real. All those times that somebody has offended you, injured you, abused you, manipulated you. All those times someone has used you, God promises I will heal that one day. I will heal that stuff because that stuff hurts. Let's not try to be too tough about it, man. If you've ever been betrayed, you've ever had someone turn against you, someone near to you has broken your heart, you know what that's like, you know? That is terrible, but God's promise is I will heal that one day. God will also save us from the enemy within, which is sin. We're mentioning that. That's what causes people to hurt each other is sin anyway. So, beloved, even though we belong to Christ, and even though he's put away sin, we still have that. We can still hurt each other, and we will. It's going to happen. It's part of the real Christian life that you and I will offend each other. You and I will say things that hurt each other, we will do things that offend each other and rub each other the wrong way, it's going to happen. Now that helps us because the very best thing we can do is just acknowledge that. Be quick to apologize and be quick to forgive. Let's be quick on that when we realize that. There's no point in being prideful, try to pretend it didn't happen, stand on your P's and Q's. That's like last week's sermon. Let your reasonable spirit be known. The humility to say, you know, maybe I was wrong about that. So we got to be quick on that. You got to be quick on that. When we do that, we will grow together. But it's going to happen. Maybe some of Christianity, it's like, yo, you have this vibe. It's just you've got to be perfect, man. I always tell the kids, you have to be perfect. Not always, but just when people come over, you know. Pastor's kids. Pretty good. <laughs> it's not like that. It's not the real Christian life. We still have sin. Can you say with Paul, a wretched man that I am, a wretched woman that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? That's the proper perspective on the Christian life, to know that there's thorns and thistles in my heart yet, and I don't want to unleash them on you. I don't. But sometimes it's going to happen a little bit, and that's what the gospel's for. Praise God. The thorns and thistles go away because that's what Jesus did on the cross. Thorns and thistles. Why is there no more of this? Because Jesus paid the penalty for it. Because Jesus bore it for us. That's why he was crowned with the crown of thorns on the cross. He was crowned with the curse itself. He drank the fury of God in the curse. And that's why one day, beloved, even amongst each other, there will come a time when God makes all things new. And then we will never sin against each other ever again. Because we will never sin again. We will never hurt each other again. I cannot wait for that day when I don't have to be worried about this sin within and it coming out. And we'll be free to love each other and to walk with God together. He will save us from the pain inflicted by each other. Do you believe that's possible? It's one thing to say, I know I'll be healed one day from the pain that somebody did to me, but someone who is a rebel against God, someone who has no interest, it's so much different when it's a Christian. It's tougher. When Christians have this, when Christians fall out, when Christians war with each other, that's tough. Do you really believe that God's grace will bring about healing one day that will cause both of you to dwell in peace together? Do you believe that's possible? Well, that's what, that's what God's Word says. And when He does that amazing thing that doesn't seem real, then we will know that He is the Lord. It's Him. He's real. All of it's real. You know what Han Solo said. It's true, all of it. <laughs> That's what it's going to be like in eternity. It's true. All of it is true. Can't even believe it, but it's real. That's his promise here in removing the thorns and the thistles. In fact, this includes all the opposition to your spiritual life whatsoever. Every opposition. Every stumbling block. Every propensity to sin within you. Every stumbling situation without Everyone who is maybe 
even in little ways, takes shots at your faith. In little ways, maybe try to cause you to doubt. In little ways, mock you for not doing these things or doing those things, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? All that stuff, God's got that. He's going to take care of that. Never lash out on that. Take that. Pray for that. The Lord says, leave room for vengeance. Vengeance is mine. Never take your own vengeance, beloved. And the principle just really goes beyond to all the things, all the pricks and pains of life at all. The reason bad things happen is because of sin. Because sin has brought us a curse on the world. That's why pain happens. That's why suffering happens. That's why sickness happens. That's why hatred happens. And the breaking of relationships. All of it happens because of sin. And God's promise is that one day, all these things will be removed. And then we will know that He is the Lord. So, let's just end with an encouragement. Okay. Okay. God's Word is full of so many promises like this. And sometimes, maybe a lot of times, they just don't seem real. It doesn't seem possible that this could really be this good. Well, God knows that. And that's why He's saying it like that. That's why He's saying, when I do it, then you'll know that I'm the Lord. It really is tough to believe, beloved. You know what I'm saying? We've got to fight to believe these things. We've got to pray that God helps us to believe Him. But at the end of the day, yo... It's not going to be till he brings these things about and then we will all know that he is the Lord. Let's pray.